Our real delight and honor to have Canon Andrew White with us this evening. He is called the Vicar of Baghdad. He pastors St. George's Church, which is a congregation in Baghdad, Iraq, that goes back to the 1830s. It is a congregation today of 6,500 or 7,000 believers in a country where it is very hard to follow Jesus Christ. Canon White not only pastors the congregation, but in Baghdad, they express the love of Jesus practically through a medical clinic that they run that cares for thousands and thousands of patients every year. They do surgeries, they uh, administer medications, uh, restore people, dental clinic, uh, eye health, uh, take care of the whole person, and they use that opportunity uh, to share the love of God and to lead people to Jesus Christ. He also cares for orphans. Uh, I believe there's about 700 orphans in their care uh, that they are raising and caring for. And uh, much like George Mueller, who uh, came from England, uh, they do all of it on faith, uh, trusting God to supply for all of the needs of the ministry. At the end of the service tonight, we're going to have an opportunity to sow into what God, I don't think we have ever, in, in 29 years, I can't remember an offering that we have ever taken for Iraq. And we're going to take an offering for Iraq this evening. And we're going to sow a big seed into Iraq tonight. I asked Canon White, I, I said, is there a, I had to push him, I had to press him a little bit. I said, is there a need specifically that you have in the ministry right now that we could perhaps give towards this evening? And uh, they're in need of the next month's expenses for the surgical uh, unit, the surgical division of the hospital. I said, Pastor, what would it take to run that unit? He said about $25,000 would pay the surgeons, pay for all the surgeries, pay for all the medications, and it would care for that unit for a whole month. And uh, tonight at the end of the service, I want us to give the best offering that we can uh, to help keep that surgical unit going for the next coming month. I want you to stand on your feet, and I want you to give the best welcome that you've ever given for our friend, <laughs> Canon Andrew White. Right, you can sit down now. <laughs> it's so good to be here. And you look quite wacky. <laughs> and I say to my team, don't send me to any boring churches. <laughs> well, I don't think you look boring. Now, do you know what a canon is? You don't. N never mind. There are two types. There are loose cannons and there are big shots. And I don't know what I am. A cannon is um, one of the leaders in the Anglican church. But before we start, I need to pray. But in Aramaic, who spoke Aramaic? Jesus, not Arabic, not Hebrew, Aramaic. And there is only one place in the world where they speak Aramaic. And that is the Christians of Iraq. So, 
שמית בבא, ברונה, רוחה, קושה, האלחה. אמין. That's praying that God, the Holy Spirit, by His power, through His Father and the Son, will be with us tonight. Another thing we always do, when, before I start the service, every work, week I say to everybody, Allahu Mana, anybody speak Arabic here? So what did that mean? God is with us. And we respond. That is, the Lord is here. And everybody responds. His spirit is with us. So I'll do it in English, right? The Lord is here. And you say, His spirit is with us. Great. Where's my Arabic-speaking friend from? Jordan. Jordan. Never mind. <laughs> I'm good friends with their king, but that's all. And that's only because he's got the most beautiful wife in the world. <laughs> but Would you like to know... A little about Christianity in Iraq. Yes. Christianity in Iraq has been there a long time. From the very beginning. By the year 38 AD, we knew Christianity was in Iraq. But... Evangelism to Iraq started before that. Do you know how? No, you don't. Well, once upon a time, God said, I'm sending a really miserable evangelist to you. <laughs> and I'm sending him by submarine. And he went to Nineveh, and his name was Jonah. He was so miserable. Have you read the book of Jonah recently? Well, don't. <laughs> because he's really miserable all the time. <laughs> really miserable. He does say one nice thing. He said, I knew that you were a loving and compassionate and gracious God. I knew that you always forgave people. I knew that you were a gracious and a compassionate God. You are gracious and forgiving. You are slow to anger and abounding in love. A God who relents from sending calamity. Do you know what he says next? Now, Lord, take away my life. It's better for me to die. <laughs> This is the word of the Lord. <laughs> yeah, but you should read what he says at the very end. Now, you need to understand Iraq is a very hot country. It's about 140 degrees in the summer. Not like Jordan. That's a cold country. We go there to keep cool. <laughs> And the miserable evangelist, his air conditioning broke. His fig tree withered. And he said... I am so angry, God, I wish I was dead. Thanks be to God. <laughs> so, fairly good that God chose the miserable evangelist 
700 years later, God sends another man. Miserable, of course. Iraq specialized in some miserable men. That's why I'm there. <laughs> and so there was Jonah and then Martoma, who took Christianity to India. And he stopped off on his way in Nineveh. Nineveh. And he said to them, See, all the people there were Assyrian. The Assyrians were like the Al-Qaeda of today. They were the bad guys. But when Jonah went there and preached to them, they became the followers of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In other words, they became Jews. Did you know that Iraq once had the biggest Jewish community in the world? You knew that, didn't you? Yeah. Got to be an Arab to know these things. Never mind. So, the other miserable person who God sent there was Doubting Thomas. And he said, didn't you know your Messiah has come? Didn't you know? I touched him. He's real. He wants you. So, all of these Assyrians follow Jesus. To this day, they are all Christian. To this day, in the midst of an Islamic country, there is one city which is Christian, Nineveh. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? Hi, Didi. Welcome. Very nice church, this. Good. So, he went there. They became Christians. And to this day, everybody in Nineveh, most of the people, not everybody, most of the people in Nineveh are Christian. Most of my people, no, not most, everybody in my congregation comes from Nineveh, apart from one person, my adopted daughter. She won't come from Nineveh because she says the Nineveh people are too mean. They're tight. They don't give anything away. So I say, Lena, my dear, where are you from? I'm just from God. <laughs> I say, fine, okay. So, Iraq had one and a half million Christians until you lot went in and had a little war there. Now we have 200,000 left. Do you know where most of the Iraqi Christians are? And Iraqi Christians are called Assyrians. The bad guys become good guys. So they're still Assyrians. So to say you're Assyrian means I'm a Christian. The biggest number of Iraqi Christians in the world today live in Chicago. <laughs> the second biggest number live in Detroit. The third biggest number live in Sweden and the fourth in Kurdistan and the fifth in Baghdad. It's amazing to think 
that God should have his hand on Nineveh to this day. That is an incredible miracle that God sends a miserable evangelist by a submarine <laughs> and his work lost. He may have wanted to die, but God's people didn't. They kept the work going. And that is wonderful. So that's why we have so many Christians. They are not converted. They have always loved Jesus. And it's very important for you to know that these people really, really have always loved Jesus. Now, I'm sorry to tell you this, but I'm not converted. All right? Because my parents told me from a little child, first thing they told me was Jesus loves you. And I believe them. I've never had one doubt in my life. I used to try and cut out a heart shape to give it to Jesus, but I was no good at that. One of the greatest theologians of all time was a man called Karl Barth. And he had spent years and years doing theology, writing books, discussing it, teaching it at university. And somebody said to him once, Professor Bart, after all your years of studying theology, what have you learnt? And he said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, this I know. Little ones to him belong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. When did you last sing that in church? Good Friday. Oh, wonderful. So, you recently. <laughs> well, in that case, I think we should all stand and sing it properly. <laughs> Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Right, you can sit down now. When I was a little boy at school, my teacher said to me, and all the children, what would you like to do when you grow up? So I answered her. I said, I want to be an anesthesiologist, 10-year-old saying I want to be a gas man, and I want to be a priest. She said to me, you can only do one thing. And you can't be a priest anyway. 
because your church doesn't have priests. Anyway, I did both. <laughs> when God is involved, the impossible becomes the possible. See, I wasn't brought up as an Anglican. I was brought up as a Pentecostal. No, it gets worse than that. I was brought up in the Assemblies of God. And my grandfather, he was very involved in the Pentecostal movement from a young age and he went to the first AOG Bible College in England and he became the bag carrier. You know everybody needs a bag carrier. I have one and assistant, you know, mine's out there. Well, his he was bag carrier to a guy called Smith Wigglesworth. He was quite good Pentecostal. And I have his Bible and his anointing oil bottle. It's rather good. <laughs> we use it in Baghdad all the time. And people get healed all the time without being punched in the belly. Smith Wigglesworth was known for <coughs> punching in the belly. Do you do that, Pastor? <laughs> I thought we could try it <laughs> after the service. We'll see. So, on my mother's side, there was the kind of Wigglesworth connection. My father's side was Baptist. I went off to medical school. I did my medicine. Who's a doctor? Any doctor, sir? What kind of doctor? Internalist. Well, we used to work with a lot of internal surgeons. I'd just stand up the end and they'd chop them up. <laughs> and I went to St. Thomas's Hospital Medical School in London. You know, it. it's good, isn't it? It started in 1106. And then, after I qualified, I became, I started studying as a gas man. So I can put you to sleep with sermons <laughs> or drugs. <laughs> and to be honest with you, drugs are quicker. <laughs> and our hospital in London was right opposite Big Ben. And... Um, I was talking to God one night. Who's talked to God today? Yeah, he's really lovely. I love him so much. I really love him. And I was talking to him and I said, God, I love you so much. Even though I've never been converted, I love you. Who's not been converted here? Who's always loved Jesus? Oh, a few of you. Good. I'm not alone. So, I said to God, thank you so much. You've enabled me to do exactly what I always wanted to do. You've enabled me to become a gas man. 
you have enabled me to run the resuscitation team. And at that stage, I thought God would just keep me there forever. And I said something very dangerous to say. What next, Lord? <laughs> and he said, go into the church. And the Church of England. And I said, Lord, they're not even all saved. <laughs> you want me to go into a church where everybody isn't even saved? He said, yes. So, I went off to the real Cambridge, England, not the pretend one in Boston. I teach at the pretend one and the real one. And whenever I'm at the pretend one at Harvard, I say to them, you know this is not the real Cambridge. <laughs> they accept it. <laughs> anyway, I went off and I did theology. It was so boring. It was the most boring thing ever. And I said, God, why did you send me here? He said, I had to. So I switched from Christian theology, which was boring, to Jewish theology. And I specialized in Judaism, rabbinics. I went to the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. That was a bit liberal as well. So, do you know what I did? I went to an ultra-Orthodox Jewish yeshiva. You know the guys with the big furry hats and the big ringlets? who go like this when they're learning. I was one of them. <laughs> I didn't have the hat, though. And my Rebbe, the big rabbi, he said to me one day, he said, Andrew, I need you in my study. I said, really? Yes, sir. He said, I need you to go and see somebody. Don't tell anybody it's a Christian. I said, Rabbi, you're sending me to see a Christian? He said, that's not all. I said, what else, Rabbi? He said, it's a woman. <laughs> Women never came near the yeshiva. So I went to see this woman. She was the most frightening woman I've ever met. And she started to prophesy over me. She said, Andrew, God is calling you to a life in the Middle East. I presumed that would be Israel. Her name was Ruth Heflin. Anybody heard of her? She was quite a frightening lady. Very powerful lady. Who's heard of her? Three of you. It's not very many. But she was an anointed woman. Full of the Holy Spirit who had an incredible calling and ministry and healing and prophetic ministry. I only saw her twice after that. She died not long after. And I worked in Israel for many years. And then I started heading up 
reconciliation for the Anglican Church worldwide. And I said, Lord, this work is based at Coventry Cathedral, bombed by the Germans, and they're still trying to reconcile with the Germans, and they are friends. This cross I'm wearing came from the roof when the cathedral was bombed on the 14th of November, 1940. The only thing that survived were the nails from the roof, and they turned them into cross. So I said, Lord, I need to go to Iraq. Why did I say that? I don't know. I just sensed that that's where God wanted me to go. Often, we don't know why God wants us to do something. But what's so important is that we're where God wants us to be. And so I tried every way to get to Iraq. Our Iraqi embassy had closed down because we'd been bombing them. And um, I tried the Iraqi interest section at the Jordanian embassy. And everybody said, we don't want you. Just stop sanctions. And then you can come. So do you know what I did eventually? I got all my staff together and we prayed. And I realized it was the last thing I did. And the next day I got a fax from Tarek Aziz, Saddam Hussein's deputy, said meet me in my office next Thursday. So I did. When you pray, coincidences happen. When you don't, they don't. So never stop praying. So I was going to Iraq for five years before the 203 war. And my church was closed, and I was getting to know all the ayatollahs and sheikhs and the bad guys and the good guys, but there weren't really any. One day, my Muhabarat man, my spy man who looked after me, he said to me, Abuna, Abuna, means my father, very important meeting tonight. I said, really? Who with? Oh, very, very important. I said, who with? I said, don't tell me it's with Uday, Saddam's son. He said, yes. I said, I'm not going then. Don't like him. He started to cry. I said, Jabba, why are you crying? He said, if you don't go, they will kill me and my family. So I went to the worst dinner party of my life with Uday and Kwasi, his brother. It was just before the two or three war. And the person who helped me all the time with whatever I needed was Tariq Aziz, Saddam's deputy. Nowadays, every week, I go to see Tariq Aziz to take him food. He's in prison. God tells us to love the prisoner. I love him. I serve him. And through serving him, I serve Jesus. Rather good, that. It's amazing how God sorts these kinds of things out. Then we had that little war. 
big war. And George Bush stood and said, mission accomplished. Ha, 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 ha. And I opened our church again that day because we had an Anglican church and it had been closed for years. And the first week, everybody at church was all the generals and ambassadors. You know, the people who think they have to go to church? So they came. And then after a few weeks, the violence was getting worse and they stopped they wouldn't leave the green zone. So all the Iraqis started coming. First week, 100. Second week, 200. Third week, 300. Fourth week, 400. I thought, Pastor, this is quite a good growth rate. 100 a week. I quite liked it. And then I said to God one night, all the people coming out of church. Our people were so desperate now. They had nothing. I said, Lord, what should I do for them? And God said to me very clearly, they need three things. They need food. They need health care. And they need education. I said, right, Lord, no problem. So we started a major food relief program. I thought it would just be for a couple of months until things got sorted out. Ten years later, we are still having to give people food every week. Because they don't have it otherwise. And then, I thought we ought to start a healthcare center. So we started a clinic, and it was rather good. Dental clinic, medical clinic, everything that people needed from a general practitioner. And we started to get many, many patients. Our doctors were Christian and Muslim, and we have six Jews in Iraq, six Yehudi, and one of the dentists was a Jew. So I say we have an Ibrahimic and Abrahamic dentists because we have a Muslim, Christian, and Jewish dentist. Rather good, that. And the, de the clinic has grown and grown and grown. And suddenly, <clears throat> it dawned on me that God had decided before I was born certain things. He knew I needed to do medicine. He knew I needed to be an Anglican priest, otherwise I wouldn't have got into the country. I'm still really Pentecostal. <laughs> but I don't tell them that. I just pray that God will fill them with His Holy Spirit. And the person who reopened my church in Baghdad was my assistant at the time. He was called Canon Justin Welby. And now he's the Archbishop of Canterbury. He's like the Anglican Pope. So who used to be looked down to by me? I now, hello, Your Grace. And now his son is my assistant. So it's amazing how God works his wonders to perform. And it's quite interesting that regularly the doctors say we need a buna to come put the line in this patient. So there probably aren't many clinics where the 
priest is called to go and put in the intravenous line or the central line because they can't get it in. But putting lines in people's veins is like riding a bicycle. You never forget how to do it. So it's rather good. It's quite funny, though, when you see priests in Iraq have to dress like priests. Not bow ties. No, definitely doesn't work. So you go with your robes on and stick these needles in people. But I can see that God planned that. God knew that I needed to be medical. He needed that this little AOGE boy needed to become an Anglican. Otherwise, I wouldn't have had a church. And I wouldn't be there. Now this church is so big. Six and a half thousand people. I have had, since that little war that you had against our country, I have had 1,023 of my congregation killed. 1,023. One day I had the whole of my church council kidnapped and killed on the way back from an Alpha course in Amman. Eleven of them. One day I baptized 13 people. The next week 11 of them were killed. Why? Because they had left their Islamic past and started following Jesus. This is a reality. When I was doing medicine, I loved my work so much. I was more into resurrection than putting to sleep because I was running the cardiac rest team. So we were raising the dead all the time. <laughs> if you did your job properly. <laughs> and when I became a priest pastor in London, I said, I used to have one day off a week and I'd go back to the operating room and work then gassing people and I said God this job of being a pastor of a church in London I said God it's a bit boring he said no you have to keep doing it so I did. And then one day I got this job. And I started doing this job in Coventry Cathedral, heading up reconciliation work. And when I arrived at Coventry Cathedral, the week I arrived to do this job, I was taken into hospital. And I was there for five weeks, and I was diagnosed with MS. And the bishop said, we don't know if you'll even be well enough to do this job. But I was, by God's grace. And then, after seven years of doing that job, I was asked if I would go and become a bishop. I didn't really want to. But when you're changing job for a more senior job in the Anglican Church, 
they sent you to the church doctors. And the church doctor looked at me and said, Canon White, you're far too ill to do this job. I said, well, what shall I do then? He said, we think you need to be retired off. So I said, thank you, and went to Baghdad. <laughs> no church doctors there. But the important thing is to be where God is calling you to be. And we have to all say right now, close your eyes, Lord Jesus, where do you want me? Amen. And he will tell you. Most of you, God wants to be here. Some of you, God might want you somewhere else. One of you, God might want you in Iraq. Not mentioning any names. <laughs> because, as you know, I'm very subtle. I'm very low key. Pray about it. <laughs> so, I was there where God wanted me to be, doing what God wanted me to do with the skills that God had given me. And he always enables you to do what he wants you to do. Now, Daniel went to minister in Iraq. He didn't want to. He was taken in exile to Babylon. But God knew why. God knew that he needed the gift of his interpreting dreams. So God gave it to him. And that's one of the good things about God. He always gives us what we need. And King Cyrus, the Persian, the Iranian, sent the Jews all back to Jerusalem. Did Daniel go? No. He stayed. Why? Because God didn't tell him to go. God didn't tell him to leave. Um, how much time have I got? Probably run out now. I? I will keep going. You hear that? Keep going, he said. Thank you, Pastor. I was praying you'd say that. <laughs> so Daniel turned up in Iraq, not of his own accord, but because God wanted him there. One day, it was Christmas, and um, I was talking to the children in the church in Iraq, and I said, I want to tell you about Bethlehem because I used to live there. And that's where Jesus first came. Little boy puts his hand up and says, Abuna, Abuna, Jesus didn't first go to Bethlehem. I said, Oh no? Where did he go then? He said, He first came to Iraq. I said, really? Tell me. He said, you remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were in the flames? There was somebody else with them. <laughs> that was Jesus, he said. Hallelujah. I said, Joseph, with 
little boys like that who needs adults. <laughs> oh, he said, Abuna, that's not all. He said, do you remember when Daniel was here? He saw the Son of Man over the Tigris, pointing to the Tigris. That's there, he said. I said, okay, I've got the message. Thank you very much, Yusuf. <laughs> it was true. One day, I was with the Ayatollah, the Grand Ayatollah, Hossein al Sada. Ayatollah says to me, Abuna, Abuna, this was just after the war. We need some meat. I said, I've got no money for meat. I've got $12 in my pocket. Oh, he said, don't worry. Pray about it. When the Grand Ayatollah tells you to pray, you pray. So that night, I got back to the hotel where I was staying at that time, and I saw a great cloud over the Tigris River. I said to God, look, this looks like the cloud of glory. But why would there be glory in such an evil place? Oh, God said, read the book of Ezekiel. So I read the book of Ezekiel. I didn't know it had 48 chapters. <laughs> Who's read the 48 chapters of Ezekiel in one go? But it was incredible reading Ezekiel and seeing that what Ezekiel experienced falling down by the Kabar River on his face was what he experienced when he saw the glory of God. He saw all these wills within wills and these strange faces. And this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell face down. And I heard the voice of one speaking. God speaks. He talks to us. He talks for quite a long time. Do we hear him? Do we listen to him? Do we do what he says? Like Samuel talking to Eli, like Eli said, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. That was the first time I had seen the glory of God in Iraq like that. It was far greater than I had ever experienced. I have lived in the glory. I had lived in Jerusalem. I had had Ruth Heflin shouting at me. But this was something else. It was the glory of Jesus. So I read the book of Ezekiel. By the way, the Jews who went to Babylon... They lived by the Kabar River. And do you know what the town was called? Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv, Israel, gets its name from the place where the Jewish exiles lived in Iraq. So God was bringing them all together. Amazing, that. Eh? So I said, thank you, Lord. You've shown me a lot. And then I remembered, 
Oh, Lord, give me some meat, please. Amen. <laughs> Next morning, I went to breakfast. A big American guy was there. He says, hey, Father, want some meat? <laughs> I said, what do you mean, do I want some meat? He said, well, you're a father, you're helping the people, aren't you? Do you want some meat? I said, yes, give me some meat. I said, how much meat have you got? Oh, he said, there are 170,000 tons. He said, I've got all the lorries, refrigerated lorries. So we took it around to everybody. If somebody brought me a carrier bag with a bit of beef and some lamb chops, I would have realized God answered my prayer. But it took me several hours to realize that these tons and tons and tons of meat were from God. Because it was too big an answer to prayer. When... We ask God to answer a prayer. Don't let it be small. Expect it to be big. God does big. I said to this man, he became known as Andy the Meat Man. He ended up living next to me in a trailer in the green zone. I said, Andy, this was two years later. I said, where did you get that meat from? Oh, he said, it was all meant for the American army, but the paperwork was wrong, so you got it. Thank God for wrong paperwork. I'm coming on to the Bible reading soon. <laughs> I haven't quite got that far yet. Anyway, one day, one day, one of the patients came to the clinic and he said, please, can you help my daughter? His name was Ahmed and he was a Muslim. He said, can you treat her through your clinic? And the doctor said, where is your daughter? He said, she's at Medical City, the main university hospital in Baghdad. So the doctor said, we can't treat somebody who's in another hospital. He said, I know what, you go and see Abuna, go and see the priest and he'll sort it out for you. So he came over to me, Ahmed did, and he told me his story. I said, don't worry, Jesus can heal her. I said, I want you, I prayed with him. I said, go to Medical City now, and all the way there, say, Yeshua, Yeshua, Yeshua. Jesus in Aramaic. He got there and the doctor was waiting for him and said, Ahmed, I'm really sorry. Your daughter has just died. He cried and cried and cried. And he eventually went to his daughter and he poured the sheet off her. She had leukemia. And he held her in his arms and he said, Yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. And she sat up. <laughs> and she said, Daddy, I'm hungry. Can I have some food, please? He came and told me this. So I said, Don't worry, it's happened before. You know, you read all these books about healings, resurrections, 
We see them all the time. Seriously. You hear people saying, I've seen an angel. So what? <laughs> They're always around. I've got some really good books for you to buy here. Buy them. <laughs> and this one of them has got pictures of angels. But we see huge bright lights in the pictures. We know we're in the angels because we can see the angels. Dowd, one of my adopted children, he takes the pictures from my book. I was getting him to take some pictures one day. I said, David, take these pictures. He said, I can't, Daddy. There's too many angels in the way. I said, well, tell them to go away. <laughs> so I said, look, David, let me have a word with them. I said, please, just allow us two minutes to take some pictures. And then you can come back. Do you think they went? No. So there they are. Couldn't get rid of them. I think God knows we need them more than not needing. One day, um, 58 people, Christians were killed in church next door to us. We arranged their funeral. They all go back to Nineveh for their funerals. And there's a picture in this book, Faith Under Fire, and all around the funeral cars, you can see angels. And the angels came with us. Our people have got nothing. No food, no health care, no education. We give it all to them. Because the Lord is here. And his spirit is with us. And people come visit us quite regularly. And they often say to our congregation, why are you so happy? How do you manage it? Ah, they say, when you've lost everything, Jesus is all you have left. We have lost everything, but we haven't lost Jesus. I'm going to come to the Bible reading now. I want you to look with me to Isaiah 19, Verse 23. It says, In that day there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. Assyria being Iraq, not Syria. Assyria. The Assyrians will go to Egypt and the Egyptians to Assyria the Egyptians and the Assyrians will worship together. In that day, Israel will be the third, along with Egypt and Assyria. The Lord Almighty will bless them and say, Blessed is Egypt, my people, Assyria, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance. That is an incredible verse. It's saying there is not one chosen people. There are three. And two of them are Islamic countries. But God is bigger than that. 
Who watches Christian television? It's awful. <laughs> All these people were saying revival is coming. Jesus doesn't say that. He says in the last days there will be wars and rumors of wars. And then he is coming. He is coming to Mount Zion, to the Mount of Olives. And then the east gate, which Ezekiel saw, was closed. And if any of you have been to Jerusalem, it's the blocked up gate. Because the Jews taught that the Messiah, the Mashiach, will come through it. So they blocked it up. And they also built a Muslim cemetery. Because they taught that the Messiah would be a Kohen. They're not allowed to go by dead bodies. But what they did not know was that he was coming that way and not that way. <laughs> Father, good that. So we know that God is doing wonderful things. We know that the miraculous is happening. We know that soon and very soon we're going to see the King. There are only two songs in English that our people know. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Where? I've got the joy, 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 joy down in. Down in my heart to stay. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. I've got the peace of Pastor's understanding down in my heart. Where? 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 Got the peace of Pastor's understanding down in my heart. Down in my heart to stay. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. Amen! Just one more song. It's so important that we worship God and we love Jesus and we sing to him. These songs are rather old-fashioned Pentecostal songs, aren't they? When did you last sing, I've got the joy, 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 joy? A long time ago. Well, this one is going to be even harder. <laughs> you youngsters won't know it. Us older people will know it. In my heart there rings a melody. There rings a melody of heavenly harmony. In my heart there rings a melody. There rings a melody of love. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Hallelujah. My every longing keeps me singing as I go. Who knows that song? 
Right, stand up, you oldies. <laughs> Not many of you. Right, no, don't sit down. <laughs> Come out here. Come on, you golden oldies. <laughs> Let's sing a song. Oh, there's more coming out now. <laughs> In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of heavenly harmony. In my heart there rings a melody. There rings a melody of love. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. May the glory of Jesus fill this place. May the glory of Jesus anoint you. May the glory of Jesus enable you all to be where God wants you to be. And one thing I always say to people is don't take care, take risks. When people will say to you, oh, take care, say, take risks. <laughs> because, because, soon and very soon, I are going to see the king. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Alleluia, alleluia, we're going to see the King. No more crying there, we are going to see the King. No more crying there. We are going to see the King. No more crying there. We are going to see the King. Alleluia, alleluia. We're going to see the King. Very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Alleluia, alleluia, we're going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah. Right, just before I hand back to the pastor, I want to remind you 
buy my books. <laughs> and that will be a way of helping us in Iraq. It's quite funny. People often say to me, I've read all your books. I say, rubbish. Oh, I've read your first one. I said, do you know what my first one was called? Yes, they say. Searching for hope in Iraq. I said, no, it was called The Role of Trichloroethylene in Caesarean Sections. <laughs> Can we sing something else? Just a nice old wacky song. <laughs> Remember the old days? Us Pentecostals in the old days? What did we sing? There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of Jesus, a big praise in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated for just one moment. Aren't you so glad that the Lord sent Cannon White to us this evening? Pastor, I used to lead those old songs and I can't remember them. There's one last act of there's one last act of worship that we want to do this evening, and that's to sow a seed into this ministry. 29 years we have never given an offering to Iraq, but I want to sow a seed into what God is doing in that country. I want to sow a seed into the salvation of Muslims and the encouragement of the body of Christ in that country. And just a moment, we're going to take an offering the way I love to. And I didn't ask Canon White, but I think he'll, he'll oblige us. If you need an offering envelope, I want you to just lift up your hand. The ushers are coming, and they're going to give you an offering envelope. You can use the offering envelope to give by credit card. You can give by debit card. If you're watching us on live stream this evening, there is a place to a link on the live stream. You can click and you can give to this ministry this evening. Uh, we'll know that everything that is given to this Saturday evening service that comes in on the live stream link, we'll know that it is going to Baghdad. It's going to the work that Canon White is doing. $25,000 is the need to run this surgical unit. Uh, Canon White said to me before the service, he said, well, he said, we pray for people for healing first because it's a lot cheaper. <laughs> but just in case God wants to use the mercy of doctors, uh, $25,000 will fund that surgical unit for the next month. It'll pay the doctor's salaries. It'll pay, pay for the surgeries and all of the medicines that are acquired and the anesthesia. But maybe they get the anesthesiologist cheap. I don't know. Uh, 
but we want to sow that seed. And listen, I want you to give. You are the most generous. You are the most giving people that I've ever had the privilege of fellowshipping with. But I want to sow a great seed into this ministry this evening. I believe that we can meet this need and we can send a gift of love to the believers in Iraq. Paul said uh, he was taking a collection for the suffering church in Jerusalem and he said, your generosity is going to cause praise to overflow to God. And I, I pray that when he carries this gift back to Iraq with him, that it is going to cause praise to overflow with God. Beloved, one of the things that I've tried to do my whole life is when I'm in the presence of wonderful people of the Spirit, I just try to, to get them to touch me. <laughs> I just try to, to make contact with them and let them bless me. And so we're going to take an offering. And Pastor, I, I hope you'll oblige us, but in just one moment, I'm going to have Canon White come and sit here in the stool. And I want you to come bring your gift we're going to lay it at his feet, like the Bible says to do. And I want you to just touch him. I want you to just gently shake his hand or give him a gentle high five or a gentle fist bump or, or grab his elbow. Just, just let him touch you this evening. There's a principle of reciprocity in the kingdom of heaven. When we make a deposit of hospitality, when we make a deposit of love, when we make a deposit of financial investment in the ministries of people who are carrying the Spirit, what they're carrying gets released to us. Jesus told them, he said, go into the villages, and he said, receive hospitality from a worthy person, and then release the kingdom. So we're going to make a kingdom transaction. Pastor Kevin, would you come and just uh, bring the stool and just set it down right here in the center? Ushers, would you come and uh, would you bring the offering plates. And uh, if you're making a check this evening, set it forward just a little bit there, Pastor Kevin. Thank you. Uh, if you're making out a check, make it to Harvest Time Church. Uh, make any gift that you're making to Harvest Time Church, and we're going to put everything together, and uh, we're going to pass it on to Canon White when the service is over. Pastor, would you come? And uh, would you come and just uh, take your place here? Are you ready to give this evening? Yeah. All right. Anybody African here? Yes, we have some Africans. Yeah. Where? Well, all the way in the back. Uh, right, now Africans know how to do offerings. You worship and you come and give your money. So you sing a song and you walk up flowing in the spirit. And then you drop it in there. What should we sing? <laughs> there is power, power, wonder working power. Blood of the land. Oh, 